Welcome back to Switzer on Australia's business channel. Is a self-managed super fund, investment portfolio or wealth building plan ready for the end of financial year? Are you aware of the opportunities available to you and the issues you need to be across? Our next guest is Paul Rickard from the Switzer Super Report. Paul is here to share some insights as to what investors, superannuants and SMSF trustees should be doing come June 30. Paul, welcome to the program. Thanks, Marty. So, the end of financial year is uh, you know, not, not far away. What are the things that investors should be doing to get their portfolios and investments in order before the uh, end of financial year? Well, let's start on the super side. There are probably four things to look at. First of all, Marty, is to maximise your uh, contributions. So we talk about the two caps, we talk about the concessional cap, yep. which is... Uh, yeah, what your employer is nine and a quarter percent. Any amount you salary sacrifice, and if you're self-employed, the amount you claim a tax before deduction. tax money. Yep, yep. Before tax money. Yep. For most people, that's twenty-five thousand dollars, the current cap. If you happen to have turned sixty this year, it's thirty-five thousand dollars. So, if you've got the money, you know you can increase the salary sacrifice, or you know if you're self-employed and you haven't uh, yet made a contribution to superannuation. Put as much as you can in up to that cap. So that's the first thing. See if you can contribute up to the cap. Yep. Secondly, look, a lot of superannuants are also taking a pension either through transition to retirement or they're actually now retired. Mm. And if you're running your own super fund, of course, if you are taking a pension, you've got to taste at least the minimum amount according to your age. So if you're... Um, There's a scale there, isn't there? There's is a scale depending on how old you are. So if you're 66, you've got to take 5% of your... A minimum of 5% of your account balance mm. out as a pension. So if you had, say... $200,000 in superannuation at the start of the year, you've got to take 5% or $10,000 as a pension. So yep. make sure you uh, take at least the minimum. That's the second thing to check. Yeah, and there's a maximum as well? Well, unless you're on a transition retirement, there, for most people, there's not going to be a maximum. Okay. But if you're on a transition retirement pension, then the maximum is 10%. Okay. But most important to take the minimum, otherwise, the tax rate on your fund, instead of being a 0% fund, becomes 15%. So you pay a big price if you don't take the minimum. Yep. So don't cut back on that and then if you're um, the third thing is is look at if whether you've got any or you might have a member or a family member who might be entitled to the superannuation co-contribution remember the government sort of still kicks in some money for the low income earners yep. and the current co-contribution is is five hundred dollars it requires a personal contribution of a thousand dollars and the income uh, has to be less than uh, $33,516. So if, for example, you have a non-working spouse or you might have a, uh, you know, an adult daughter or, or son or somebody who's doing some part-time work but earning below the threshold, then maybe you think about making a contribution, a personal contribution of $1,000 and hey, presto, the government puts in $500. There aren't too many free handouts from government, so mm. the super co-contribution is still one of those things yep. to look at and not forget about. Still there as well? Still there, still $500 is providing a personal contribution of $1,000 is made. The only catch is they've got to be working. So at least 10% of their income, that amount I quoted, $33,516, has to be from an employment source. So that's why it suits perhaps, you know, a, a spouse is working part time or maybe perhaps, you know, a, uh, an adult child who's doing some casual work or something like that. Is there anything else from a, a, um, a super perspective that we now, need to one, be aware one of? One last point, Marty, uh, is that Spouses? there's still yeah there is still a tax offset for um, uh, if you make a contribution on behalf of your spouse. It's yep. a maximum of five hundred and forty dollars. Requires a contribution of three thousand dollars, and uh, your spouse has to be earning uh, less than ten thousand eight hundred dollars. So, look, all things to to look at in terms of um, at least looking at the superannuation side. Mm. You mentioned the caps before. They always seem to be changing. Always something. So it'd be changing. nice. Can we just repeat what they are or what they're going to be one more time, just to make sure that we're across it? Now? Okay. For this financial year, yep. the general cap is twenty-five thousand yep. dollars. And if you six, turn sixty or over this year, it's thirty-five thousand yep. dollars. Um, that increases. The general cap increases to thirty thousand dollars from the first of July. Next financial year. Yep. Yeah. And that sixty becomes fifty. So that from the next year. Those under 50 will have a cap of $30,000 and those over 50 will have a cap of $35,000. Okay. The non-concessional cap, yeah. which is it's set at, which is your, your own money. Yep. You know, after so tax. After tax money. Yep. Uh, the non-concessional cap, which is set at six times the general rate increases from $150,000 to $180,000. So you'll be able to get more, a lot more money into super come the, the 180 starts after July 1. After July 1. Okay. Uh, 
Are the considerations different for someone who is running a self-managed super fund compared to someone that is in a, a retail industry fund? Are there any different issues that you need to be aware of? No, the, the super issues are exactly the same, but of course if you're running your own fund, it's also the time to make sure that the investments <laughs> are where you want yeah. to be. Yeah. Yeah, and really should you start with your asset allocation, have you got the right mix between the asset classes, potentially look at the sectors. You know, probably that time to look at some maybe the dog stocks in your performer in your portfolio if you have any. Yep. Uh, and you know, maybe I believe take... you sold one today. Um, well, I talked about it. Really well. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to the Switzer Super Report, yeah, so okay. I might throw out my QV. I haven't actually done it yet, Marty. It requires a bit okay. of discipline. Yeah. <laughs> to Think, do that. Thinking about it. Thinking about it. Certainly high on the list. It's always yeah. with best intentions. Look, if you're an industry or a retail fund, I mean, you don't have to make those same decisions. But of course. Still, the, the key thing is to make sure the investment option is what you want it to be. And so, it's surprising how many people don't know what their investment option is. Uh, and we're saying that someone should actually possibly be in a, in a growth option, but they're in a say a, a balanced option. Yeah, yeah, might have decided to get a little too conservative, or vice versa, be in a fairly conservative option, and they're going to actually have a long time before they need to retire, or the money's going to have to long, last a long time and possibly should be thinking about a growth option. So, look, don't just stick with the default or whatever you were in last year or five years ago. Um, you, as we age and our lifestyle changes and circumstances change, it's also worth looking at um, just sort of what option we've done. And most superannuation funds make the change from option A to option B you know, pretty easy and there's, all, there's generally no fees to pay. What about investments outside of super? Is, is there anything we should be doing with the end of financial year approaching? Well, an interesting uh, end of financial year because tax rates change on the 1st of July, so that may be clouds. Well, so can you just tell us the change? Well, there's actually two changes. One that everyone's forgotten about, yep. <laughs> which is called the, uh, the Medicare levy goes up from 1.5% to 2% okay. to pay for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. That actually starts on the 1st of July, so every taxpayer is going to find a tax increase coming on the 1st of July. It's got almost zero publicity the last few months, but it's out there. And then, of course, for um, high income earners, they're also going to pay an extra 2%. So those currently um, paying 46.5% on their marginal dollars, you've got to be earning more than 180000 they'll see their tax rate go up to 49% from the 1st of July. So normally what we'd say to people coming into the 1st of July from an investment perspective is you try to do two things, if you can. Yep. One, you try to potentially prepay any expenses. So, for example, uh, you know, just as a timing issue, if you can prepay interest on an investment loan or if you've borrowed money to invest in the share market, got a choice between paying interest monthly or paying in advance, you generally see if you could try to prepay it. Yep. Provided you've got the cash flow, it means you can claim the tax deduction this year. If you do have income that potentially you might want to defer into next year and you can do that legally, then maybe you defer income. So the idea is try to maximise the deductions and if you can, potentially defer any income. A little different this year, as I said, with tax rates changing and maybe you've got to think pretty hard about it. The other impact, of course, is capital gains tax. Uh, and again, again, from a personal investment point of view, Marty, if you've taken any gains during the year, then it might be time to look at your portfolio and see if it's time to crystallise any losses. Yep. And that way you can offset gains against losses. Conversely, if you have any losses that you have taken or if you have carry forward losses from a previous tax year, and you have other stocks that have done pretty well and you do want to take a gain, again, it might be the time to sort of put the two aside. So, again, a bit of capital gains tax planning. One of the reasons the share market often struggles a little bit in June is sometimes what we call tax loss selling. And so it's just a time to sort of reorient the portfolio and start the financial year with a fresh approach. Excellent. Now, what's your view on markets at the moment? Look, a really tough, tough market at the moment. Um, I did a couple of figures. The market's up 2.2% uh, on a, on a, just on a price basis year to date, 4.2% yep. when you add in dividends. Um, interestingly enough, what we're seeing is that the so-called defensive sectors or the yield-based sectors are doing better, yep. in particularly banks, and I think that's symptomatic of a market that's uh, seeing a higher currency. Some of the cyclical sectors are struggling. Uh, and we're almost seeing a return back to the last financial, the last year when the market was led by, you know, the financial sectors, property trust to a secondary extent, utilities and telcos. All the defensive sectors are doing well and the so-called growth sectors are struggling. Mm. So you think the banks can go higher? I think for our market to get to 6,000, they have to go higher. Um, can get to 6,000? I think we can get to 6,000. I think we're going to grind. I think that's, uh, look, it's a... The word I'm using now to describe what's happening out there, it, it's not falling away, but it is still inching high and it is a grind to get there. 
Look, one of two things needs to happen. For me, we either need to see some great economic data um, or we need to, to see the currency fall. And I don't think the latter is going to happen. Mm. If anything, I think the currency looks like it's looking pretty strong. We're looking like a high interest rate economy. You know, if, if, if some of the economic data was a little disappointing today, if it stays that way over the next couple of months, it wouldn't surprise me whether an interest rate cut comes back on the agenda again. Mm. And I think our currency looks like it wants to go higher. So in that environment, it's almost like the yield stocks, the finance um, banks are going to lead higher. Yeah. There's no downside for the banks at the moment. You know, profits are high, revenue's growing, bad debts are not there, and we're talking about lower interest rates or the potential of lower interest rates still. Last question before we go. Regular viewers and readers would know that you've developed a number of portfolios that you write about in, uh, in the Switzer Super Report. How have those portfolios been faring? Doing pretty well, particularly the yield portfolio. In fact, the last uh, six months, the yield portfolio is up, or um, well, this financial year, up 6.9% compared to the market's 4.2%. Uh, uh, Growth portfolio, because it's got a few more cyclical stocks, current stocks looking to benefit from the currency is actually struggling a little bit. So up a little bit, but it's lagging. And I think that's symptomatic of the market. It's been the, you know, the stocks and the sectors perhaps that weren't expected to be either doing better, and it's just this grinding market um, driven by people chasing yield. And you finally think the currency is possibly going higher now? I'd like it to go low. Yeah. I mean, I've been, as, as says Peter, we've all been expecting, you know, the, the low 80s at some stage. Yeah. But at the moment, it shows absolutely no sign of it. And I think we're sticking out almost as a, as a high interest rate economy again. And in that environment, it's hard to see why our currency is suddenly going to find the bit of selling pressure. Well, Rickard, thanks for your time. Thanks, Marty. After the break, we'll be joined by Miles Stord from the Global Value Fund. Don't go away.